Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Jake. I'm the president and CEO of the Intermark Group. So excited to have you here. Um, got another great topic to discuss and about how the last two years of stress and everything on our horizon is really changing how we are processing information and the effects that has on marketing. Uh, joining me today is one of our staff psychologists, Dr. Rose Smith. Rose works um, in a clinical setting prior to joining Intermark and Alloy. And so she actually is working firsthand with some of the people who are experiencing that stress. And so we couldn't think of somebody better to come and talk about this topic uh, with us today. So uh, Dr. Smith, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, excited to have you. Thanks, awesome to be here. Before we get into this, as always, I'll start with a little bit about Intermark. Intermark is a full service advertising agency headquartered in Birmingham, Alabama. We've got offices in Tampa and Atlanta. Um, and the short version is we do everything under the marketing sun from traditional TV, radio, print to heavy digital. In fact, we do more digital work these days than anything else. Uh, we've had the privilege of doing work with some of the coolest and uh, most successful brands in America. What brings them all together and unifies them is this commitment to leveraging the behavioral sciences uh, to get better outcomes. Now that we've covered about Intermark, let's get to the topic at hand. Um, which is about how insanely stressful life is. You know, when we first started talking about this, we were thinking, man, COVID just won't seem to go away and it's really affecting people. And then over the last month, it was like an avalanche of, oh, we have supply chain issues. Gas prices are spiking. There's a land war in Europe and on and on and on. And it's creating some massive stress. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, when we started this, we were just talking about the stress of the Omicron surge and how difficult it is for us and our businesses and our families. Um, and then like between starting this a month ago and today, I mean, everything has gone more to pot and it's um, even more stressful and uncertain than it was a month ago. It's, it's hard to believe that it could have uh, gone worse, but it, it has. And so if you are on this and feeling a little bit of stress yourself, know that you are not alone. The American Psychological Association just released this study a couple of days ago. So it's super fresh research, basically showing that we are finding stress in lots of stuff. And it's all the stuff you are aware of, Russia, global uncertainty, supply chain issues, massive lifts in the costs of everything, and just this general anxiety. And you've still got COVID sitting out there in the background that we feel like it's going away here in the US, but it's still lingering. Some people are still wearing masks. We still are worried about another surge. Um, and it's having an effect, on an effect on how we process information. Um, and one of the things you said, Rose, that really struck me was stress almost manifests itself in fear. Right, absolutely. So we are wired by evolution to fear uncertainty. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But in any times that are uncertain, it creates a fear response in human beings. And we are in this time of massive uncertainty. We don't know what's coming next in terms of, um, you know, the war in Russia, um, supply chain issues. And we also still really don't know what's coming next in terms of COVID. Yeah. Um... Now, it's having a profound effect on uh, stress-wise. Now, this uh, data is getting a little long in the tooth when you start talking about things that are a year old, but the U.S. was already under what we would call extreme levels of stress. Uh, a third of Americans reported extreme levels of stress, and oh, about half of people uh, reported they were having trouble sleeping at night. And this is before all of the recent series of negative news. And that has changed how we process information. Once we're in a long-term stress period and enter into that fear state, um, we don't process information in the same way. We aren't making decisions in the same way. Jake, I like what you said about extreme stress because we kind of moved past the point of fight or flight, we'll talk about this in a minute, to this like ultra level of stress, which creates a different, even different response in human cognition. We get here honestly. Because our brains were built for a different environment to deal with a different sort of stress. I love how you talk about how we got here and how the world is different than we were built for. Sure. So like it or not, um, you know, our, we still have caveman, cavewoman brains. In fact, our, you know, emotional part of our brain is still very, very similar to primates. Um, and we evolved, evolution has favored brains that fear uncertainty. And for good reason, we never really knew what was lurking around the corner. Um, it could be a human foe, for example. So this is a skull from the first known war um, among humans is 10,000 years old. But even dating back to one or two million years ago, we knew that there could have been human foes um, lurking around the corner. We also knew there could have been animal foes lurking around the corner. Um, this bad boy, 
is a 240 pound prehistoric hyena and it was a predator. Event. I know, right? Imagine walking out of your cave or your hut and there's this guy sitting there. So our ancestors that um, did not fear kind of what was around the next bend or even different looking animals or new people um, did not survive. And this last one, this is a three, uh, sorry, six foot long prehistoric cave lion, also a predator of human beings. So naturally we, you know, our ancestors that didn't fear uncertainty, knew things, what was lurking around the corner, what was coming next, didn't make it because it got eaten or maybe it potentially a uh, massacre, massacre, you know, in the head. Um, it's not just the scary things that uh, we dislike about uncertainty, right? No, we evolved to even be fearful of un like beautiful things which are uncertain to us. So this is um, hemlock, which creates a total neurological um, shutdown response that quickly leads to death. And it mimics many other flowers, but we evolved to even be unsure of things that are beautiful like this plant as, as we should be, you know, don't eat the hemlock. <laughs> and what's really uh, profound about this is that because we're in this stress period, we're leveraging part of our caveman brain, if you will. We're processing information in ways that are not normal. We don't process things the way we did two years ago. We are literally scared to death in a way. Uh, you know, totally. So psychologist Nicholas Carlton says that the fear of uncertainty is actually more um, primal and more uh, prominent than the fear of death, meaning we're more afraid of uncertainty than we are of dying. And so when Jake talked earlier about extreme stress, you know, we're all familiar with the sort of anxious fight or flight stress response. Um, that's when our sympathetic nervous system gets activated. We sweat, our blood pressure goes up, et cetera. But there's actually a level past that when our sympathetic nervous system gets completely overwhelmed and our parasympathetic nervous system kicks in, which lowers our heart rate and creates this frozen response, otherwise known as a feigned death response. You can see it in animals, like think about a possum, you know, playing possum, but you, we also see it in humans where there becomes a frozenness, an immobility, um, an inability to take action. And as marketers, our job is to get people to take action. And so the, you know, frozen fear response is kind of our enemy, right? It could completely paralyze our customers from taking action. Let's dig in on that a little bit more, you know, how we're processing information differently and how we are making decisions differently. I love this quote um, that we like novelty when we choose to instigate it, but when it's shoved in our faces, um, we dislike it. And man, we've had a lot shoved in our faces in some ways, quite literally, you know, COVID, we were getting things jammed up our nose on a regular basis. Forgive the mild pun, but I also mean it literally. Like it's this level of stress that's changed how we are processing information. So the first lesson is that because we're in this extreme state, we don't like extreme levels of novelty. Now I'm not saying we don't like creativity. We absolutely do and we'll respond to it, but it's that shock value that we respond negative, negatively to. Right, big um, difference between creativity and novelty. You know, right now is not a great time for novelty, but we wanna be clear that that doesn't mean you can't be creative. That, that's exactly right. So the first lesson here is if you're thinking of something that, that's going to be attention getting, it's gonna make people feel uncomfortable, just don't do it. Just as Big Bird would say, in is for nope, 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 nope. Now, I know the creatives out there beginning to say, but wait a minute, our job is to get people to pay attention. That is absolutely true. But because we're in this stress fear state, we've got to find different ways to get people to pay attention than just pure shock value. And so let's talk about that uh, a little bit more. It's another example um, about things that are new that uh, kind of stress us out. You probably saw the news lately about Walgreens. They started shifting to these digital displays on their cooler doors. Now, the way this works is you can't actually see what's in the cooler, rather you see a digital representation, and this allows them to show ads. And they ran some tests, you know, over the last couple of years that show, hey, consumers like this, and they just rolled it out. Well, guess what the stressed consumer thinks about this today? And is for nope. Yeah, they hate it. It's the change. It's the unexpected change. It's the lack of familiarity. It's asking us to process new information in different ways. Now, this may prove to be a great thing over the long term, but this is the worst possible time to be rolling out something that is radical change for those consumers. We're just not prepared to deal, deal with it because of our stress brain. So the headline here, if you get nothing else, we aren't marketing in normal times. So all the things that we talked about doing two years ago, you need to put those on your shelf or reevaluate them more importantly to see how people in today's world, a stress world, will react to them. What we see is there are a lot of lessons that we can learn. There are five that we're going to cover today. Quickly, uh, we're going to talk the, 
about the ambiguity effect and how the a stress brain really dislikes ambiguity. We're looking for more certainty. Two, choice overload. Um, we don't like lots of choices in the best of times. And in today's world with a stressed brain with high decision making, we deal with it even worse. Number three, we're looking for some emotional validation to help get people to pay attention to some of our content. Number four, we're going to lean into the familiarity principle, the things that we are familiar with, we are more resonant to, and we have greater relationships with. And lastly, the nostalgia effect are fond memories of the past and how we can leverage that to alleviate people's stress to get them to pay attention and engage with some of our content. Let's start with the ambiguity effect. Now we all get what ambiguity is, uh, Rose. Why don't you explain the ambiguity effect? So the ambiguity effect is taken from behavioral economics, which is the behavioral economics is the brainchild of um, ec ec economics and psychology blended together. It's brilliant. And it basically suggests that we don't like ambiguous things. We like things that have certain outcomes, even if it's not in our own best interest. And one of the things about behavioral economics is that it actually shows us how we actually behave as opposed to how we self-report that we behave or might assume that we behave. And so the ambiguity effect is really important um, and this time of uncertainty and learning how to manage that with your customers. So lesson here is that humans will avoid things that are ambiguous or missing information. We're drawn to things that are certain. So one way you can think about this is to be clear about what your message is and not try to get someone to think through ambig ambiguous signals. So this is an ad from several years ago from McDonald's. I'm sure you immediately recognize they're taking their uh, iconic logo and putting it into mildly ambiguous situation to get you to think a little bit, engage with it. And this I'm sure was wonderfully successful for them and in the future will be wonderfully successful again. But in today's world, with the way we're processing information it is likely to generate frustration amongst the consumers because of that ambiguity principle. This would be a total bit of a stress point for our caveman brains that are already so overloaded with the fear of uncertainty that they're kind of in a shutdown response. You know, if you're in a shutdown response, this is not helping me get to McDonald's at all. So let's think about how we leverage the ambiguity principle. I'll give you something that we're all familiar with. Amazon, we all do shopping. Uh, Rose, you found a couple of products here that are near identical. The difference in the products is a major difference in price and perhaps more importantly, a major difference in the number of reviews. And what does that teach us? That shows us that we like cer certainty. We don't like ambiguity. So I'm pretty sure all of us would probably go for the one on the left because it has 50 over 51,000 ratings, even though they're essentially the same product and the one on the left is more expensive than the right one. So we favor what's unambiguous, um, often to our own detriment. Certainty, leaning into that. So how do we take advantage of this in messaging? Well, we want to give customers clarity, vision, and as much information as possible. Now, you can think about this also in terms of a brand message. What is your point of differentiation? And boiling it down to one thing that is crystal clear and repeating that one message on a regular basis so that the reason to buy your product has clarity as opposed to ambiguity. Now, this goes back to lessons we've been talking about a long time about branding and that system one point of differentiation, and it's becoming increasingly important. I want to show you a couple of uh, examples we come across that we really like. This is an ad that we found for Cruise Tools. Um, simple message, lifetime warranty, no questions asked. I can't think of something that is less ambiguous than uh, this content here. And right now, I mean, who wouldn't pick that, right? If we could have certainty about anything, like I can assure you that the Russia thing's going to resolve. I can assure you that we're not going to be dealing with COVID next year. Uh, I mean, we'd all pick something that had a kind of a lifetime guarantee. I think that makes a lot of intuitive sense. Another good example is somebody that has leaned into their brand to, um, to establish a point of differentiation and done so in a creative way, but with by remo removing the ambiguity about their product. Oikos Triple Zero Protein to help maintain dad's strength. Oikos Pro Protein to try to get stronger than dad. Strong! Stronger! Stronger! I'm getting the dad's strength. I just know it. How you gonna have dad's strength when I'm the dad? Strength? How do you think I gave birth to you and your big head? Oikos Pro. Oikos Triple Zero. How strong do you wanna be? I love how unambiguous the differentiation in this is. It's not just about protein, it's about the effect of that protein. So I could use this as a good example of branding and that point of differentiation, but in an ambiguous world, in a high stress world, this should be a very effective way of communicating. Yeah, totally. 
lesson number two, man managing choice overload. Now, we talk about this a lot, particularly on websites and applications and helping people navigate through the product set, but a stressed brain doesn't deal with choice even as well as we normally do, which is normally fairly uh, poorly. And we got a lot more choices than we uh, used to today. Take grocery shopping, for instance. It used to be, well, I would drive down to the grocery store, which is close to my house, which for me happens to be a Publix, and I do my, my shopping there. Well, now I can shop anywhere. And you log on to Shipt or Instacart or one of the online delivery services, and one of the first things you do is have to choose where you're going to get your groceries. And it's things like this that have proliferated the number of decisions that we have to make because of the new world in which uh, we live. Um, and I love this notion, you know, we love variety, but when we've got too many choices, when we've got too many decisions to make, sometimes life's a little too spicy and things begin to freeze up. What's funny is at the beginning of COVID too, I think most of us thought that our choices would be restricted, right? That we we're going to be stuck at home, yada, yada. And in fact, it has generated even more um, choices than ever. Uh, Rose, I'm going to put you on the spot here. You told a story the other day about how you woke up with the sniffles and all of a sudden it led to tons of additional decision-making for you before you ever rolled into work. It did. I mean, I had to think, should I get a COVID test? Do I send my son to school? Do I not send him to school? Do I make him wear a mask? Do I not make him wear a mask? Um, you know, if I get a COVID test, where should I get a COVID test? What meeting should I cancel? Also, I'm a mom, so I'm ordering on Instacart, well, you know, which store should I buy groceries from for dinner tonight? I mean, I could probably go add about 20 more choices all before, <laughs> 9, all before 9 a.m. And a lot of us are doing that right now without even really being consciously aware of it, that we are having to make so many more choices just throughout the day just to kind of function normally. Yeah. And I, I, I didn't cry, but I was close to crying that morning. And you know, what is fairly well researched is that we kind of have a reservoir for total amount of decisions that we want to make, that we're willing to make. And once we hit the end of that reservoir or we choose um, not to make a decision, we are choosing not to make a decision, not just to make a quick decision. So Mulder research really illustrates this when we put products on store shelves, when we gave people six options, about a third of people bought um, one of the products. When we uh, quadruple the number of options, thinking oh, consumers love, options. Well, it actually dropped by 90% the number of people who bought at all. Now, this is in a non-stress or normal environment. This research is several years old. But what we know is that in, in a stress environment, in a high decision environment, which we currently find ourselves, this is going to be even worse. The more options we give people, we're inducing them to opt out entirely and simply to not make a decision to not buy, which is what we're trying to get at. So how do we uh, mitigate choice overload? Well, number one, we've got to make decisions super easy for the target audience and give them those simple points of distinction. Secondly, and this is going to be somewhat challenging for a lot of us, we've got to limit the number of options provided. Now, this is difficult because every marketer I know wants to lean in and give our consumers lots of options, and we simply can't do that. We've got to pull that back and restrict it. Number three, we've got to make that shopping process easier. Go revisit your website. Go revisit your mobile app. Take a look at the things you have on your store shelves and make them simple and uncluttered. And then let's use marketing to help guide them through the process. Now, this makes the most sense on your website, but it can certainly apply to any piece of marketing and make that shopping path as easy as possible. Great example of this comes from the most valuable company in the world, Apple. Apple rolled out a new product. It is a digital high tech product, which means they could have given us hundreds of options to choose from. And instead, they gave us two. Do Apple's secret sauce. They've been doing this forever, man. They make it easy to do business with them. You can choose the base model, the iPhone 13, or you can choose the Pro, which has an advanced camera, and that's it. And then, of course, their website is super easy to, uh, pack, to navigate you through the shopping process. Um, and it's a great lesson for the rest of us. If Apple can boil down their choices to just two, the rest of us can probably do a better job of making our selection process easier. Another way to manage that choice overload issue is within our marketing is to narrow the focus of our content. So Coca-Cola famously has, I don't know, hundreds of different products available that I might want to market, and they have shifted heavier into being singularly focused on that marketing effort. Here's a great example from them recently. And 
I love this ad from Coke on a multitude of levels, but it's a great example of helping to manage that choice architecture by being singularly focused. They use a lot of the other principles we're going to talk about here. Uh, really well done. Um, another way to help manage that choice architecture is by hyper focusing on the use cases of your product or service. Now, this is an ad from Hellman's, um, and Hellman's can be used in hundreds, if not thousands, of different recipes. But in their marketing, rather they chose a singular focus. In this case, for BLTs, which I know we all love, and they're using that as a way to build their brand to help limit that choice architecture. A BLT is good. A BLT with Hellman's is the best. Nothing tastes like it. Hellman's, bring out the best. Uh, nicely done. Again, this is a, a simple way to help manage choice overlay. You give this a little thought, you can find ways to integrate it, including in places where you don't think you can. Um, great example from the team here at Intermark. They were charged with uh, helping promote uh, tourism across the state of Alabama. Tourism is notorious for having hundreds of different things to promote. They want to promote the beaches, the restaurants, the Space and Rocket Center, and on and on and on. Everybody wants their voice. Finding a way to boil that choice architecture down to one simple concept, in this case, being a relaxing vacation, de-stressing, not only helps consumers understand your point of difference, difference leading to our first uh, principle, but also with that choice architecture. I want to go to Alabama because it's going to help me relax. Um, and this is another good example of how to help boil things down. The third principle, provide emotional validation, probably comes a little bit more intuitively to you. I know um, every time I have read some recommendations on how to help my friends when they're going through a tough period in life is to start by simply acknowledging what they are feeling. Right. So pay attention, everyone, because this can help your marketing and probably your marriage. <laughs> um, so emotion validation is the process of understanding and then conveying understanding of someone else's feelings without judgment. And we know, I mean, research has shown over and over again that it increases feelings of warmth, trust, connectedness, and that is between people, but also between a person and a brand. So, you know, I think some of us have been a bit leery to be negative in our marketing, but right now it's, it's a great time actually to validate how people are feeling. And that's a way to bring them closer to us, to endear us to them, and to build a more trusting consumer brand relationship. So not only does this create affinity, but it'll help get people to pay attention in the first place because they're so stressed. We're very selective about what we want to pay attention to. And if I, we can relate to it, if you'll validate what I'm feeling, acknowledge what we're going through, it's a great way to kind of break through that wall of clutter and to acknowledge what um, we're all feeling, which is, which is stress, quite frankly. And one of the things Jake and I talked about, you know, the other day was that we, right now, the way to get people's attention is actually to calm them down, to not excite them. And if you kind of rewind to our beginning part where we talked about the caveman brain, most of us are in this frozen state, um, doing things that are soothing, like providing emotion validation, is actually a better way to get someone's attention than, um, you know, changing up the Walgreens, um, you know, uh, facade. Oh. Uh, a few great examples of this. Again, this comes from the team here at Intermark, State of Alabama Tourism. This is an ad they ran uh, recently during COVID. And man, it is one that I can relate to. You know, while not the exact same situation, I think we can all relate to having our kids, our pets in the background or trying to have online meetings and things like that. And as a result, I lean into it. I'm like, oh, you're talking to me. Yeah, I, we're like, I get it. I get it 100%, 100%. 100%.
I love this ad that you found from Jansport, um, where they take a slightly different approach and talk to a sub-segment of the population. Now, we all go through segmentation. We want to talk to our own target audiences. They do a spectacular job of both emotional validation, but to this target audience that often gets ignored, in this case, teenagers. With the current state of the world right now, there's a lot of stressors. All the pressure and from coming from different angles and all the expectations coming from different places, it made me lose who I was as a person. I think what a lot of people struggle with now, especially teenagers, is putting yourself first. Once I realized that I am stronger when I ask for help, like that's when everything changed for me. Talking about your mental health with your parents, that's huge. Talking about your mental health with your friends, that's giant. Share what you're going through, be vulnerable. It's okay to take care of yourself. It's not selfish. And once you start making progress, it's the best feeling in the world. Even just you talking about your own experiences can impact someone else. It's okay to struggle. You're not weaker for struggling. I'm never gonna be 100% perfect, but I'm figuring it out. And that gives me a lot of hope. Such a great ad. And the, you know, the crazy thing about this is that Jansport actually maintained their sales during COVID when no one was actually even physically going to school, but people were still buying backpacks. Um, and part of it is this whole campaign that provided so much connectedness and emotion validation with this particular demographic. Really, really well done. Uh, last example we'll show here are from the folks at Iceland Tourism um, that really helped us relate to what we're all feeling. I'll, I'll let the ad speak for itself because it's well done. And well done, uh, Iceland Tourism. I love this on a lot of levels. You can actually go to their website and record a screen. They've set up speakers around the country to actually play the screen. So it feels like they're following through on this brand promise. And it has been wildly successful. Now, I know we've all got a Jones to travel because of COVID, but Iceland recently had a national dialogue about whether or not they should restrict tourism because they've had so much tourism. Um, Certainly, uh, this ad campaign can be partly responsible, and it's a great example of the power of emotional validation and getting us to, to pay attention. Last example um, we'll show is from the folks at Progressive Insurance. Uh, Progressive is known for some of their wackiness uh, within ads. Um, they do a good job of keeping the spirit of that alive while, while acknowledging what we're all feeling and relating to it. And in a way, it helps them break through some of the normal clutter. So with your home and auto bundle, you'll save money and get round the clock protection. Sounds great. Sure does. Shouldn't something, you know, wacky be happening right now? We thought people could use a break. We've all been through a lot this year. That makes sense. Oh. Now's not a good time, three-fifths of sync. Are you sure? You have us booked all day? Read the room, guys. Yeah. All right? Well done. I love the read the room part, too. I mean, that's emotion validation, right? It's like, you know, read what people are feeling. It's fantastic. And it also shows that you can provide emotion validation while not necessarily being macabre or boring or anything like that. That's right. And they've still found a way to be creative, to leverage celebrities and keep the spirit of their tone alive but while adapting to what people are currently feeling. It's really, really well done. Now we're going into point four, but I want to pause and remind you that we will be taking questions at the end. So at the bottom of your screen is a Q&A button. Feel free to put questions in there and we'll save them and we'll answer some of them at the uh, end of today's uh, session. 
Um, but point number four, the familiarity principle. Now, during a stress period, we like the way things are. Uh, we don't like change. We saw that example earlier with Walgreens changed some of their screens and our reaction to it. Um, but we also like known entities and finding unique ways to relate to those entities can leverage the familiarity principles. We talked about the Walgreens examples as a what not to do um, and the negative uh, enforcement that this can generate. And I know it's tempting to roll out your new systems if you're talking to your agents in the field and giving them new ways to engage with you. You might want to at least think about how you roll that out, if not pausing all of that for a, a beat until we can get past some of the immediate levels of stress. But there are other ways to relate, um, such as leaning into things that are already familiar. Now, the folks at Heinz sells ketchup. One of the ways that they found to do creative marketing is by rolling out a ketchup-themed puzzle. Now, puzzles are familiar, particularly during COVID. We're all looking for something to do. And what better thing to do as a family than sit around and do a puzzle? So it's just basically a giant red puzzle. And they sold it. And they got covered up. Not only did they sell out, they got massive coverage for this. And a great way of taking something that is familiar, baking it into your marketing, even though that is mildly unrelated from anything to do with ketchup. Yeah, it's kind Love of double, it's double familiar for COVID, right? I think some of us use a lot more ketchup because we're like fixing kids' meals at home. <laughs> and then we also, you know, did a lot of puzzles. So you know, go Heinz on this one for sure. Um, another way to approach this by leveraging familiarity is by using images and concepts that have high levels of comfort and familiarity. Uh, the team here at Intermark really recently did a campaign for Positions Mutual. They used uh, their ongoing celebrity uh, that has a uh, long time so expression for Positions Mutual, but leaned into that concept of familiarity and comfort in the spot. If Physicians Mutual were a friend of yours, we'd be like Eddie here, loyal, dependable, and always there for you. We'd be the one you'd talk to about retirement, the complexities of Medicare, and the coverage you'd need. We'd listen and give you straightforward answers. Mm. Think of us as your devoted retirement friend. Mm. At Physicians Mutual, we'll help you find the coverage you need so you can have the retirement you deserve. Oh, good boy. Physicians Mutual, Physicians Mutual. You know, there's so many elements we could point to in that that gets at that familiarity, the comfort, the slippers, the comfortable clothes, the dog, um, even this uh, painting Bob Ross reference at the end and the music, it all leans into that familiar and comfortable in this life that retirees, which is their target audience, envision for themselves. Great example of a different way of leveraging that familiarity principle including new packaging and branding. Now you found this, I love this as an example. You may not have noticed, but Campbell's redid their logos and their packaging. For the first time in 50 years, and it is still very familiar. I mean, I love this, they nailed it. it you know, they modernized it a little bit, but it's still that same familiar image. It's not gonna throw us off. We can see the row of them, you know, right when we're in the supermarket, um, kind of go straight to it. So, I mean, they, they did a great job on this one. You know, in package design, I know is always tough, but it's particularly tough for the stressed consumer because if we have a radical change, you're likely to have to overcome initial negative concerns amongst your core customers. And Campbell showed that you can do both. You can still freshen things up, by, but without alienating people uh, during a, a time like today. All right, principle number five, and this is closely related to the familiarity principle, but very unique in and of itself is the nostalgia effect. Nostalgia, of course, references how we remember the past more fondly, and it is because of how we remember information. We revisit positive memories more frequently than we revisit negative memories. So I love to think about the time I had a home run at Little League and revisit that memory, whereas I don't really like thinking about the time I put my car in a ditch when I was 17 years old. In fact, I try not to think about that. Thus, the one I revisit more frequently, I have warm, fuzzy memories about hitting a home run in baseball, and that's the source of nostalgia. And man, are we nostalgic right now. We are suckers for it right now, Jake, for sure. We're looking for that feel good. We're looking for something to alleviate stress, and this is an easy outlet for us, and we're beginning to see it pop up. Now, it is worth noting, at the very beginning of COVID, there were a lot of talking heads that were saying, here's how people are going to deal with stress. It's going to be retail therapy. That didn't right. pan out, did it? It did not pan out at all. So retail therapy actually went down um, during COVID. Now, this Alicia Silverstone reference is a bit nostalgic. So naturally, some of us may be drawn to that. Um, but no, retail, <laughs> therapy actually, retail therapy actually went down, except for in a few select areas, which we'll um, talk about in just a second. But yeah, no retail therapy was going on during COVID. 
Instead, we're finding out that a way that we're alleviating stress is grandma. Grandma's the new black. We like things that uh, bring up those positive memories that make us feel comfortable. And so if you're struggling with how to apply this, this is a good construct for things that are going to resonate. We have been purchasing more and more things that are reminiscent of grandma's house, grandma's kitchen. And remember, it's a nostalgic grandma. So actually, my grandma actually wasn't very friendly, but I do remember her as being very friendly. So we've been buying things like sourdough starter, gardening, old fashioned stationery, um, paperback and hardback books instead of digital books. Um, Bible sales, uh, you know, home cooking supplies, everything that sort of reminds us of grandma, um, all of those, including home remedies like cod liver oil, the sales of all of those did go up during COVID. We're seeing this as a macro. Yeah, we're seeing it as a macro trend in shopping as well, as you pointed out. Right. So even in, you know, shopping, um, sales have gone up and there is a, a trend in shopping towards more nostalgic clothing. I think my favorite thing is this woman over here on the bottom right who is wearing a thousand dollars worth of friendship bracelets. And uh, that's a that's a lot. Um, we Jake and I might need to put our kids to work on starting to make friendship bracelets. But, you know, I will admit that I fell prey to this a little bit. So during the Omicron surge, I, I bought this bracelet and I bought it in lieu of like sitting under my desk and rocking back and forth. And I feel like that was pretty good retail therapy for me, but it was nostalgic for sure. It's a good example of how nostalgic can make us feel positive. We're beginning to see this baked into advertisements. Uh, we see one here that harkens back to something that at least people my age uh, can relate to. Uh, it's a reference to Kenny G to help sell beer. Whenever you crack open a bush light, the mountain starts singing. It's cold and it's smooth and it's waiting for you. What is going on? Mountains of bush beer. Hit it, giant Kenny G. It's so smooth. Hey, for the mountains of bush light beer. I love this ad so much. I mean, I think we either remember listening to Kenny G ourselves or like me, I remember my parents' Kenny G CD that was played over and over again. Um, I mean, I just, I think it's great. And the country music, sort of like the kitschy, you know, familiar thing. I mean, they nailed it in this one. Yeah, uh, really well done. We're seeing this a lot. If you watch the Super Bowl, you saw a lot of nostalgia, including using some of our favorite toys from childhood to sell high-tech products. Barbie really wants this dream house. It's got stunning views and a slide. Barbie's ready for fun. So cool. And Barbie found out about this dream house with an alert from Rocket Homes. She did? Well, it's a super competitive market. Everyone wants to buy the dream house. Better offer Betty. I'll go 10 over asking. Cash offer Carl. Straight cash. House Skipper Skipper. Let's tear it to the studs. You vultures, you're gonna start a bidding war. This is less than ideal. Oh no. Don't worry, Barbie has a verified approval that shows her finances are backed by Rocket Mortgage. So Barbie wins! But we need a house! Oh, I found a fixer-upper castle on Rocket Homes. It has good bones, but really bad neighbors. <laughs> I like his vibe. Get your dream house all in one place with Rocket Homes and Rocket Mortgage. For a better way to find and finance, Rocket can. Thanks for helping. No problem, it's good for my glutes. Man, if you can slip Skeletor into an ad, you're getting my attention because that harkens back to strong emotional periods for me. And I imagine a lot of people felt the same way. And the Barbie's dream house. I mean, who didn't want a Barbie's dream house? I mean, yeah, with, I, without not, question. But I certainly did. Yeah, really well done to appeal to a diverse audience. Set. And we saw this nostalgia lean in other areas of the Super Bowl, including the halftime show. You know, the year prior, we had the weekend and I don't know, I can't speak for everybody because I'm a little out of touch with pop culture at times, but I didn't know who The weekend was going into it. The weekend was great, like his music. My kids were educating me and we're singing it some afterwards, but this Super Bowl was nostalgia central. It was the music that we all jammed out to when I was in my formative years. Um, it's the first time mom's up singing during the Super Bowl and kids loved it. Yeah, I mean, I think if all of us think back to our various Super Bowl parties, I mean, like everybody dialed in, got up, was totally vibing with this. Um, they did a great job of providing comfort and fun, very nostalgic. So I think they completely nailed it on the halftime show. Yeah. And they weren't playing new tracks. They're playing all of the 
throwback songs that we could all relate to really dialing into nostalgia and it was one of the reasons it's such a highly rated halftime show we're seeing this in some other areas as well you might have noticed burger king is rolling out new creative as well as a new logo and you might think wait is that a new logo well kind of it is awful close to the logo they used to have that we grew up as children um, and so it is a throwback nostalgic logo and they're going to lean into this in their marketing as well um, really tapping into this feel good effect to help them gain differentiation yeah i mean even just looking at this i am more naturally drawn to the one on the right i mean i it, may, it just it even makes it look a little bit healthier which i is, is strange to say but <laughs> it's very compelling um they did a great job i'm, I'm really happy that they've made this pivot yeah. rose i'm going to keep telling myself that it's uh healthier now that you it is that. it is you know, we can't have a conversation about leveraging nostalgia and marketing without a reference to Bluebell. They built their entire brand around the concept of nostalgia and how we have this perception that things used to be better and inserting themselves into those memories. It's the first day of the first grade and she found a new best friend. It's a laid back Sunday afternoon wish would never end the homemade taste of bluebell and good friends gathered round the good old days are being made right now Oh, and this is something I think many of us would have thought was maybe cheesy three years ago. But if you think about how many people's weddings and first days of schools and all of that stuff were interrupted, it's so compelling right now. Yeah, yeah it's particularly poignant and a great example of uh, leveraging nostalgia. So how do we leverage nostalgia? You use those images and messages that remind us of those warm, fuzzy places, grandma's house, childhood, the good old days, et cetera. It's a great way to get people to pay attention to generate some additional affinity above what we normally have. And I think you saw some good examples of agencies continuing to be very creative, even in these frameworks. And so we don't want to diminish that uh, idea of being creative. So. To recap, uh, we're super stressed. We're processing information in very different ways and making very different purchase decisions. So the lessons for marketing are five. One, to leverage the ambiguity effect, to be clear about what you are, to lean into a strong, strong brand point of differentiation. Two, manage choice overload, limit the number of options, provide a nice, easy path for people to make some of those decisions. Number three, we can get people to pay attention and generate some positive feelings by uh, providing emotional validation, by acknowledging what people are feeling and helping relate to it, to let them feel that it's normal and the tie our products and services to those feelings. Number four, leverage the familiarity principle by step one, don't make radical changes right now. And if you do provide a nice pathway to those changes and then tie to things that we have levels of familiarity with to make that a purchasing decision a little easier. And then lastly, leverage the nostalgia effect and the warm fuzzy feelings that we get from um, the good old days, if you will, um, because we're looking for things that'll make us feel better in this stressful period of life. And we saw some great examples there. Um, if you like today's content, know that we put out a lot of additional content. You've got our website, uh, intermarkgroup.com. There's a subsection there called Insights, and that is where we put out at least once a week some psychology marketing related content. We boil it down to one minute. It's called the CMO Minute. Strongly encourage you to subscribe. If you don't want to go through that, just visit any social media uh, platform that's got Intermark on it. You'll be able to come across our content. Um, I hope that a lot of you have questions and we're going to get to uh, a lot of those. So uh, let's shift gears a little bit and answer some uh, questions. See that we've got a lot of uh, questions. Um, we'll start with uh, asking if we will share the slides. We will come back to the website tomorrow. We'll have a video recording of the uh, whole presentation as well as the deck that you can uh, download. Um, got a question from Marquise that asks, how does this work for artists whose creativity is an offering of what is new? Where's the marriage between familiar and the new? Uh, great question. And, you know, we initially had some concerns when we did a run through of this, our creatives like uh, ask, wait, are you telling us to not be creative? And that's not the case at all. In fact, we're saying the opposite. Creativity is needed now more than ever, but we need to acknowledge what resonates with people. And there are things that used to resonate with people that no longer do, and in some cases can generate negative emotions. And those are the things that we want to 
uh, guard against. And that's what we're trying to illustrate here, give you some new directions for that level of creativity. And it doesn't mean that we don't create new, but we have constraints around what that new is. And then there are some cases where new is just not appropriate. Is, is that a good way of processing it, uh, Dr. Stone? That's fair. And I would also say that it just, it actually takes more creativity right now to connect with people in a healthy way. And that, um, you know, you can still introduce new material as long as you're doing it in a way that's validating, that is also connecting with some aspects of what are, are familiar to them. I mean, you can still be new, um, like, you know, um, some of the style trends are new or at least new for the last 40 years, um, but they're still connecting in a way that's nostalgic and familiar to people. Um, you know, and closely related to this, one of the questions was how do we get uh, people's attention uh, when things that are, are not new? I think we light, laid out a few of those examples. Um, and really the big challenge here is to get through that stress brain um, because we don't want to think about things. We're not looking to process information in ways that we normally do. And so we've got to change how we talk to people just to, to merely uh, to get them to pay attention. Yeah, when people are in a frozen brain state, the way to get their attention is to actually calm them down, not to add additional incoming information. So um, we do get people's attention. It's just in a, a different path right now. Yeah, um, so provocative question about the Coinbase QR code ad that we saw during the Super Bowl. Um, I give my point of view on it uh, and I've got mixed feelings about it. You know, on one hand, I, uh, saw their press release that they crashed their servers. They had so much uh, web traffic. Um, the CEO of Coinbase actually got into a public dispute with their ad agency over who came up with the idea. So clearly they are happy with the outcomes. Um, I will say this, because it was novel and unique, it probably got some additional attention. I suspect they generated some negative sentiment at the time. Um, I can share, you know, what was going on at my house. We had some folks over to watch the game um, and everyone was kind of caught off guard and felt a little uneasy. Some folks were worried about, I'm not scanning that. I'm going to get a virus on my phone. Um, and it was just that whole sense of something new here. So I think it probably cut both ways a little bit. Yeah, I think we'll have to see how it plays out long term. Um, but I think my general sentiment is that it was probably not a great, not a great choice. Well, great. We are at time limit. Uh, Dr. Smith, thank you so much for joining me uh, here today. For everybody else, please send us your uh, additional questions. Let me know if you'd like to chat. I'd love to continue uh, the conversations. I also just realized I have a nostalgic photo of myself that's pre-pandemic before I went almost entirely gray. So that's a little bit of a throwback as well. Um, so thanks to everybody uh, for joining us. And uh, we will see you on a CMO Minute sometime soon. And when there's enough good content, we'll do another webinar. Looking yeah. forward to it. Thanks, everybody. Bye.